So then just reminding what we saw um, yesterday. No? So we talked about thermalization. We said the, the question was when this part of the infinite time average that we got by evolving this observable, when this infinite time average would agree with uh, the microcanonical ensemble. And we said, well, based on what we had already seen from random matrices, where all the vectors are just, uh, all the eigenstates are just random vectors. So we said, oh, if I compute this expectation value, no? so if I compute this expectation value with one random vector, another random vector, they will all be very similar. So then in this case where we have these random vectors, this side and that side should agree. So this we already talked about, uh, thinking about random matrices. No? So these random vectors are what we are calling chaotic states. So chaotic states guarantees um, thermalization, fine. So today I want to move to physical systems, not matrices filled with random numbers, now physical systems. I prepare many more slides that I'll be able to tell you. So I'm going to start skipping things here. But you have the slides available. And if you want, if you see any of these things that I'm skipping that you would want to discuss, we sit down and talk, OK? All right, so the next part was to present to you other kinds of random, you can't tell me. How are you relating that the microcanonical OK, so what we were saying is, we studied the evolution of this observable, right? And we said, well, this term here de de describes the dynamics, but at long times, this term just gives us more fluctuations, and we are here. So this is the equilibrium point. Now we want to know whether this equilibrium point, this, this equilibration value, this saturation value of the dynamics, that's why we have this question mark, whether this agrees or not with a result from a thermodynamic average. So which ensemble I picked, I pick a microcanonical ensemble. So it's an average in a small window of energy. And I'm trying to uh, um, find out when this could agree with that. On this side, we have the components of the initial state. Huh? Here, we have just the average of those uh, values. And when could this be true? Well, for sure, if I have just random vectors. Okay. It's isolated. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, then there was that discussion with Michael, canonical and microcanonical should agree at long times, no? This kind of thing. Oh, long yeah. times with so large season. I'll be mumbling because I'm I'm jet lagged today, but worse than yesterday. Uh, <laughs> so is there an equivalent of ETH for canonical on some? Well, we, we've done comparisons with uh, the canonical ensemble also and seeing that things get bad as increase the system size. There are papers, yeah, there are other papers that I didn't mention here where people try to connect a single eigenstate with uh, like firm Dirac distribution. So that also, if you want, I can, I can give to you. Okay, so look, you have, you are awake so you tell me when I say stupid things because, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Okay, so then what I uh, wanted to, these slides I'm, I'll be skipping, but um, I wanted to tell you there are other kinds of random matrices where they are not completely filled. And uh, they were <clears throat> trying to bring us closer to the real systems where the real systems if you look at them, the matrices are very sparse. You see many zeros here, and you have non-zero elements just within a band. And so these random, these other kinds of banded random matrices are trying to bring us closer to that. So I'm going to skip them because it was just a description of things. You can ask Edwin, who is someone who has worked on these um, matrices, and I'm going to go straight. Okay, so these are all discussions of these other kinds of random matrices, but I'm going to go straight to a physical system, all right? We sit down and talk about those if you want. Okay, so I'm selecting here a very simple system. It's just a chain with spins half. I'll describe it. And then, then we can uh, you can extend that to more complicated scenarios. But what is a chain of spins half? On each side, we have this spin half, which is a, um, a system with two levels, right? So spin down is I'm calling 
the lowest energy and spin up the highest energy. I'm also calling it an excitation. And how I'm going to denote this two? Well, with uh, zeros and uh, one or ups and downs or with vectors. If I want to describe this system with a Hamiltonian, well, let's pick the Pauli matrix in the Z direction so we get the plus and the minus energy. All right. Now, I'm using this language of spins half to denote this uh, system with two levels. But if you prefer, you could think about hardcore bosons, for example, where you have the absence of presence of the particle. You know? So we are just using a representation, using spin halves for a representation of this uh, system with two levels. But what it is in the lab depends on the platform you are studying. You know? Now, uh, let's put just now two spins, not just one. And well, they will be interacting according to this easy interaction. What do we have from this interaction? If the two spins are parallel, we get to the plus you know, from the Pauli matrix. If it's up and down, we get the minus. What does that mean? If this coupling is negative, so if the coupling is negative, this would be our ground state ferromagnet. If the coupling there, this delta, de, delta delta is um, positive, we would have an antiferromagnet. Okay, but we have a little one more term in this Hamiltonian, which is this x x y y is the flip flop term, similar to a hopping term. Why the x and the y they are the off diagonal elements here. They flip the spin, and so <clears throat> when we apply this term on a state up and down, we get a down up. And so we are moving the spin up or this excitation from one side to the other. Okay, but we'll have many more sides. So this is the kind of Hamiltonian that we have. Once you learn how to write your code for this Hamiltonian, there are many, many things that you can explore. So let me tell you some things that we can find in this Hamiltonian. Well, you could play with different geometries. You could have a chain or a ring. You can, you can have two chains coupled, so it's a ladder. You can have two dimensional system of three dimension. Um, the couplings here that you see this delta is telling us that the Z term, the ZZ, may be different from the XXYY. So delta one is isotropic, delta different from one anisotropic. Uh, in this case, we are just using couplings between nearest neighbors, but we could play, and I think this is the purpose of this school now with long range couplings. And uh, we, we mentioned now that if we put this alpha very small, we are going to go to another limit. We will reach an integrable point where we are not going to have many body system anymore. Um, and then we have, we can have on-site disorder. So this term here is, uh, indicates the Zeeman splitting of each site. We can make them random. So then we have on-site disorder. We could also put the coupling random. So you see how many things you can start exploring. Um, and this is just spin half. You can put spin one, spin three. No? So then it's being one in uh, each site where you have uh, three possibilities. So you can start analyzing classical, um, quantum classical correspondence very well. Um, the system has several symmetries. One of the symmetries is uh, the conservation of total magnetization in the Z direction. So this uh, chain here, no? this system here where X and Y have the same amplitude, no, the, the coupling in X and Y have the same amplitude guarantees that we have this conservation magnetization in the Z direction. And so the Hamiltonian commutes with this term. What does that mean? That we'll have a Hamiltonian like this. No? There'll be a block where we have two spins pointing up or another block where we have just one pointing up. So we have these blocks. No? So each block is a, a subspace, you know, it's a sector, and uh, they don't communicate. You know? So they are, um, they are blocks. Now we have this conservation. This helps us when we are writing the, the Hamiltonian matrix. We can take advantage of this symmetry and concentrate on just one of these sectors. So we decrease the dimension of the matrix a little bit. But it's, if we are studying K, you pick the block that is uh, 
the largest one or one of the largest ones because that's where chaos will settle, will show up. And there are other symmetries as well. Um, parity, now if, if I don't have this order here, parity is a symmetry that shows up. So you put a mirror here, this state is equivalent to that. If you're in the scenario where you have half of these things up and half of these things down, you also have this spin reversal kind of symmetry. If delta is one, and again, clean, chain, no disorder, you have this other symmetry to take into account. Why I'm mentioning the symmetries, uh, for those people who are trying to study level statistics, you have to take into account all of these symmetries and study just the sector where no symmetries remain. No, because if you're going to do level statistics and you start mixing the levels from this sector with the levels from that sector, you don't have any reason to have repulsion anymore. No, they are from, it's like playing with different Hamiltonians. Okay, so careful with the symmetries when you're trying to do uh, level statistics. Okay, so um, integral spin half models. In this case of one dimension, no, of spins half with couplings just between nearest neighbors. This Hamiltonian here is integrable. And the word integrable that I'm using here is in the sense that you can solve that with the beta answers. I think Alessandro is the guy who probably knows about beta answers the most among us. I don't know. <laughs> but you can ask him more about it. I, I when I was um, reading about this, I, I learned a lot, a little bit about it in the um, appendix of this uh, paper. I thought it was very nice, and there is a super nice paper, very pedagogical. You can get it uh, online that also explains about these beta answers. If you ever want to learn a little bit about that, and is the what they call the coordinate beta answers. Very well. What I'll be saying here is just that for this kind of system, if you look at the level space and distribution that we discussed yesterday, you get Poisson. All right, but is then Poisson. Once we get Poisson, we are done. We know for sure that the system is integrable. Well, there are some um, exceptions or some um, variations of this story. So this is detailed, but I just wanted to mention to you. We could have a system with too many degeneracies, like the X, X, Y, Y model has many degeneracies, and you're not going to get a plus one. You get like a peak of degeneracies. There are some kind of spectra that people call picked fence spectrum, which was like um, systems where you have almost um, quasi, you know, where the levels are almost, um, it's almost like a harmonic oscillator where all the levels, the spaces are the same, so almost equidistant kind of thing. So there are some spectra where you can get this as well, and then you, you will get strange uh, uh, distributions, not Poisson and um, not Vigdant Ice and Spick Fence. Mm -hmm. Just to tell you, there are, it's not just one, and it's the end of the story. There are some uh, groups who created integrable Hamiltonians that would show a Vignard Dyson distribution. So I put here one of these examples by Ar 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 Armando Relayon. There is another paper by Seligman. But this kind of Vignard Dyson distribution is very non-robust. You change the parameter a little bit, and then you lose it. Okay, and then you recover the, the Poisson. And the other one that I wanted to mention to you, yeah, tell me. Because the long range for those integrable systems. Uh, okay, if you if you think about all to all couplings, is it for the one by relying on paper? I don't know if anyone studied the long range case. And wait a second, if it's integrable, it's plus on. But they found some uh, uh, structure there where they could get that Vigna dice. You change it a little bit, it becomes Poisson. But then you're asking if you would add other terms to the Hamiltonian or no? Vigna dice only in the level specification. Ah, you think about level number variance. Ah, no, it should be the same. If, it, if it's Vigna dice, you should get some kind of uh, logarithm behavior. That would be a nice thing to check if it escapes early. I now understand what you're saying. Okay. But if it, there is repulsion in the neighbors, 
it's because it's, there is some rigidity in the spectrum. Okay, the other model that uh, I picked here is, okay, for people who study localization, they are familiar with this, uh, this model. What you have here is on-site disorder. So if you, if you are right in the matrix, the, um, the diagonal has these random numbers. And uh, this is just hopping. So where this term appears, it's like a three diagonal matrix. So it's a very simple kind of matrix. In one dimension, this system is very well known. It's localized. It's known as Anderson localization. Fine. But if you, and this is uh, well known uh, in the thermodynamic limit, the system is localized. But if you pick a finite system, you're playing with it. You're just um, having some fun with the model. And so you pick a finite system and you choose values for that on-site disorder that gives you a localization length that is larger than your system, well, then the system doesn't know that it's localized, yeah, if the localization is bigger. And then you start getting all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what the plot that I'm showing to you here is that uh, ratio of consecutive levels, right, that tells us if we have a big nadis or if we have a Poisson. But I'm, I'm showing this number as a function of this parameter. What is this parameter? It's the localization length divided by the size of the chain. So if the localization length is smaller than the length, we are here, Poisson as it should be. But as you start, um, as you start increasing this parameter, so your localization length is getting larger than the chain, you'll be able to see everything. You get GOE, orthogonal, unitary, symplectic, and pick fence when you start getting like, um, almost equidistant um, levels. But this is a finite size effect, right? but just um, for your curiosity. And chaotic models now. In the case of um, to get chaos, to break the integrability of this, System, there are many ways we can add couplings between second neighbors. Now, this is the strength of those second neighbors. It's not immediate as it was asked yesterday. I put any value here and I get a big Dyson. No. Uh, as you start increasing this from zero, we go Poisson and it's starting getting more and more deformed until eventually when this is 0.5 or close to one, you get uh, the big Dyson. But we also see that as you increase the system size, you see that that appearance of the Vigna Dyson starts showing up for smaller and more, smaller values of that lambda. Okay. Now, do we need all of these terms here? No, you could have just the ZZ part, second neighbors, or you could have just the XXYY part. You broke symmetry, or you broke uh, integrability. And so this is a model that sometimes people don't realize because this is equivalent to hopping. But if you put this flip-flop nearest neighbors with flip-flop second neighbors, you will see it's also a chaotic system. It's not just a free um, models. If you want to check, if you look at uh, uh, using the uh, host, host and Premakov or Jordan Vigna transformation, you'll see that it's not just hopping that survives, there are some terms of interaction. Back. No. No, wait, I, I didn't go back. This. Yes. Here, here you will see. So lambda zero, this is integrable. If lambda becomes enormous and this dominates, this is also an integrable. Okay. The other one, very popular among people studying many body localization, now you have that um, model with couplings between nearest neighbors and you add on-site disorder. So what we are saying here, now we have these Zeman, uh, Zeman splittings, but each site with a different random number, on-site disorder. If this disorder strength is not large, what does not large mean? Uh, if it's of the order of this coupling parameter, a little smaller, you're going to get the big nut dice. Okay, 
Now, I want to tell you about one more case that uh, maybe it can sound like a surprising scenario. I have this uh, model with couples between nearest neighbors. If I every all sides have the same Zeeman splitting, if I have an open chain, open boundaries, if I put one little defect at the edge, the system remains Poisson, remains uh, integral, can be solved with base answer. But if instead of putting on the edge, I put this little impurity, the Zeeman splitting different from the others, at a different site, not at the edge, you get Vigna dice. Okay. So this is a paper that I wrote when I was still a postdoc in 2004. And people were very skeptical. They were saying, no, this must be a finite size effect. How can a tiny perturbation like this uh, uh, bring, uh, give you chaos? And then <laughs> I went to show, no, it is true. What I'm trying to show in this plot, that beta is the beta from broad that we talked um, about. No? So when beta is one, that means Vigna Dyson. And all these different curves here is showing as I'm increasing the, the size of the system, the range of that little impurity increases also saying, okay, it's robust. It's not uh, um, um, unrealistic. It's not a finite size effect. It's real chaos there. So what is special is not chaos when you have a many body system. What is special is to find a model like this <laughs> that is integrable. No, these interactions are making things very complex. I heard a voice, no. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah, tell me. Yeah. So let me let me see if, if I understood what you said. So the localization length depends on the disorder. No, so we are playing. Once, once it, once the disorder is zero, yeah. So it's it's this case here where it's equidistant. The levels are almost equidistant. That's what we are reaching. Because of this, now if think about if the levels are think about the harmonic oscillator, right? If this is always the same uh, number, I know, delta, if this is always the same delta, if you try to make a distribution, there is no crossing. So Poisson is telling us that there is crossing. So here it's all of them equal. So you have a peak wherever this, this value is. No, that's what I'm saying. In these many body cases, yes, usually that's what we get. But that's why I just try to show that there are some exceptions. Yeah? Like uh, this is an exception, this is another exception. So that kind of figure is in this case, is the what they call peak trends. Okay. So, and then the chaotic cases, we talked about uh, several examples and then we, I'm, I'm there with this little impurity bringing us to this cha chaotic as a what as a function of so this little d is a Zeeman splitting is the size is the Zeeman splitting is d from defect it's an impurity okay and uh, Nathan Andre <laughs> talking uh, with Alessandro, Nathan Andre is someone who told me, no, I cannot believe you. This is a, a finite size effect, but it's not. No, you see that it's, it's robust there. It's, it's showing up. And if we have chaos for this tiny impurity, you will have thermalization as well. We check this. Okay. This is a good question. Time scales of thermalization, that's something that um, probably we are going to discuss today. Time scale for thermalization depends a lot on the quantity that you study. For everything that I've studied so far, for the models that I've studied so far, physical models, I see this time growing as the system size increases, which is like, how are we going to talk about thermalization? But this is another story, okay? Now, um, 
there was a nice paper by John Gould in 2018 studying this system and then studying transport behavior. And he realized that for this system, the transport is ballistic. There was uh, many studies uh, connecting spin systems, ballistic transport with integrability and uh, diffusive transport with scales. And then he picked this system for which we have thermalization, for which we have Vigna Dyson distribution, and he got ballistic, ballistic transport. That made some people like uh, Marco Zinidarici to say sentences like this. Oh, you put a small perturbation, you get chaos, and he puts with quotes, you get chaos if you study level space and distribution, but the transport behavior is more similar to that of an integrable model. So when I saw this <laughs> papers coming up, I said, oh, I should let people know that this is not the only one. Even this simple model, the easy in a transverse field, you know, so this is easy in a transverse field, if I put my impurity, that also gives me chaos. And this is a spin model that is more complex, but it's also integrable. If you, if you put the impurity, you get chaos. Okay, so nobody studied the transport behavior of these guys, but perhaps you will also get a ballistic behavior. I think that's the Say it again. And right to identify. Ah, okay. I, uh, if this L over two is the size of the chains L, so I put the impurity in the middle somewhere. You can put anywhere, actually. We check that. You cannot put at the edge. At the edge, then it's still integral. If you put it outside, even second site, it should be. You you broke you broke the the symmetries of this integrable the integrability associated with base ansatz. I try to I don't know if this will convince anyone, but when you write the matrix in the Z basis, this looks like a tiny perturbation. No, that is a but if you write the matrix in the eigenstates of the x x y y part, it's messing up everything. So I don't know. It's yes. Uh, so your calculations of level statistics you probably have to count a certain part of this, right? Middle, so as always, that. yeah. Right. Do you, did you ever look at how, I mean, the, the low energy eigenstates are probably still more strong? The, yeah, right. even, even with uh, next nearest neighbors. Yeah, even with next nearest neighbors, but I was wondering if uh, from the threshold Poisson and Wigner Dyson, how does it scale with system size? Yeah. In the impurity and in the next this is a, this is a good question. and this is something that I have always wondering. <laughs> Where is the threshold? How does it depend on energy and on the system size? And now you're bringing how does it depend on this model? That's something to be studied. I didn't study that. No? But for the bulk, it is very robust. Okay. Good. But then um, you will have a, a parity in this story. So you, have, you need at least two of them or take the symmetry into account. Okay, and this is just to, to say again, as I increase, you see, uh, as I go from red to orange, I'm increasing the system size and that range for that impurity chain that uh, Bigna Dyson is, is real. Yeah? I'm going to skip this paper, but I think you, you can read, but I, I'm just going to put these questions, which is we discussed a little bit at the end um, of the lecture yesterday is, so what is chaos? Now, because Marco Zinidarici is saying, no, I want to see diffusion to talk about chaos. Huh? Well, but that, that was it's just a motivation for bringing up this question. Huh? Um, we've been associating chaos with level statistics, chaotic states, thermalization. One is a consequence of the other here. Huh? We also talked about the exponential growth of the out of time order correlated um, in the end of last lecture. I'm just bringing these questions for you. Like, uh, what is the final answer? One and three, I think, is the most um, uh, popular ways to see quantum chaos. No? 
but one and three happens at very different time scales. So. Okay, and uh, remember the out of time order correlator that I mentioned yesterday. No, so is this commutator, and we are studying how it's growing in time. In this chaotic system, it grows exponentially fast, and this rate is coincides with the classical Lyapunov exponent. Am I speaking too fast today? <laughs> um, no? Okay. You're falling, right? Okay. No, so this grows exponentially fast, and the rate coincides with uh, the classical Lyapunov exponent. Very good. Since I'm presenting some uh, exceptions of the rules, let me show an exception for this uh, behavior as well. This exponential growth coinciding with classical Lyapunov exponent was checked. No? So Galitsky has this paper for the kick rotor, then he did the same for billiards. Uh, with uh, Jorge Hirsch, we have this analysis for the DK model. No? So with these systems that you have the quantum and the classical, you can check where you can find the Lyapunov exponent in the classical limit. You can go to the quantum domain and see if it coincides with that uh, exponent. So all that is good. But I just wanted to bring, again, one exception to the rule, just to make you think. No? Um, classically, even forget about case, pick a system that we know very well is integral, the pendulum, no? Sim simple pendulum. But now put it upside down. This is an unstable point. And uh, you're going to get a positive Lyapunov exponent here, but this has nothing to do with case. This is just instability. No? So this instability will show up also in the quantum domain. So uh, this model here is the Lipkin model, is an integrable model, but it has a critical point. It has a, 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 a quantum phase transition. So if you study the out of time order correlator right at that point, you will see an exponential growth with positive Lyapunov exponent, okay? But it's an exception to the rule, it's one special case. Okay. It's an isolated point, so it's measure zero, yes. Exactly, exactly, no? it's measure zero. But if you, uh, so you have the point here. If you move it a little bit, remember that you have a quantum uncertainty. So you still get a little bit. If you have to really get out, then, then this is gone. Okay, so this is the story about careful with the symmetries if you're doing level statistics, just to show an extreme case here. This is two random matrices, but not coupled. And if I look at level statistics, I get something weird there. No? because it's like a symmetry that I didn't take into account. If you start putting more of these blocks, you will see a nice uh, Poisson. It has nothing to do with the integrability. It's just you're mixing the, the eigenvalues. Okay. And this is the discussion about symmetries. So um, remember the correlation hole, the ramp. I told you that there are some advantages. Short and long range correlations are there. You don't need to do unfolding. It will find the hole even if you have symmetries. So that's a nice thing. It's true, everything will be shifted up, but you will see it's still going to catch that there are um, some level repulsion there. Okay, so the general picture is that Poisson integrability, Vigna Dyson chaos, but you saw some little um, exceptions to the rule. So um, yesterday, go on. Go of course. And now we have the symmetries. And then you, you, you say, I look at, if I don't separate by symmetries, I'll see a Poisson there. But if I go to the um, spectral form factor, the survival probability, you will see the ramp. That's the thing. Also, 
Oh, you get a hole, but it's not described by the ramp. It's not about the BTU function. Yes. So that is a that's a good example. You see a thing that is very below the saturation point, but it's not going to be described by the ramp that you get from Bigner Dyson or for random matrices. The what? Ah, the inverted pendulum. No, so no, it's not. I just, I have my pendulum and I just invert it. Not driven or not. It's just to tell you that this point is an unstable point. Any tiny thing and the thing goes away. Yeah, but it's, it has nothing to do with chaos. It's just instability. Yeah, then, yeah, but... But it will never come back here, no? It, it's, it's, it's an un, un, unstable point, and it got, got out. Yeah, it is integrable. It has nothing to do with chaos. What, yeah, okay. <laughs> you get a positive Lyapunov exponent use, looking at the tangent space for that unstable point. There is no uh, very yeah. short time. We, we, yeah, the behavior is at short times, and uh, um, yeah. I think that's what you're saying, right? The initial role, the transient is exponential. Yeah. But it's not what you just want to chaos classical. And do you if we consider the class as the component, we have to say the key to easy key. Okay. But but the, but what 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 is the Lyapunov exponent? Is the sensitivity to the initial condition? So you have this initial condition. Anything, any tiny variation will give you something completely different. If you are right there, you are on the point. If you are a little bit out, you get out completely. That's but the that's what the positive. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Huh? Defining the Lyapunov vector and take the limit t going to infinity. I know. But it's the, the it's with respect to that initial condition. It's these two are completely different. So confusion yeah. within our community we typically say, okay, well, we look at the exponential growth of the out of time order correlation function and say, okay, that is the Lyapunov. The thing what we are saying is, okay, be careful because if you pick an unstable piece, an unstable point like a bifurcation in, a, in, a, in an integrable system, and you compute that growth of, of, the, of, the, of the out of time order correlation, you will get exponential growth, but that has nothing to do with this. Yes. Yeah. So you're saying the same thing, essentially. But classically, you get. It's it's not for the classic for, for that point for that specific point. My 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 definition is we we take a thing to easy thing. Yeah. So our definition is we look at the exponential growth of the. Okay, but I am not not okay. My 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 question is. Uh, uh, in my definition, uh, if we take a piece of infinite limit, then the lambda should be zero for a single uh, diagram. And the same thing happens for the integral of quantum system with uh, o -O -T -O -O -T -O -C. O -T -C. No. To no. no. You see the exponential growth if you put your initial in, state in, 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 on that unstable point. In short time, I agree. Yeah. But, but it doesn't make sense. It already evolved. So, oops. It it grow it grow it grows exponentially, and then there'll be sat some saturation because it's a quantum system. But it has this exponential growth. Last 
but we can I, I, we can talk more about this okay ah uh, okay so then where i was i talked about the symmetries and this is the general picture uh, okay okay so um yesterday we started talking about eigenvalues of the random matrix and then we moved to the eigenstates so today we start again talk about the eigenvalues of the physical system. And now let's move to the eigenstates. Okay, tell me, no question. Um, for the, still for the eigenvalues, the density of states for random matrix is that semicircle. For physical systems where you have two body couplings, you no longer have a semicircle, you have a Gaussian distribution, we mentioned that yesterday as well. And this Gaussian distribution is very important because what it tells us is that chaos should be in the middle of the spectrum, not at the edges. And that's what we are going to um, discuss more today. Remember the plot for the participation ratio. All states are equivalent. All states are just random vectors. When we come to physical system, it's not like that. In the middle of the spectrum, you have states that are very much spread out, very much delocalized, not at the edges. And of course, there is a dependence on the basis. Which basis are we going to use? I think we discussed that also yesterday. It depends on what you want to study. Are you studying many body localizations? So then perhaps you want to, well, you want to use this kind of basis because you're studying localization space. But you could also play with these basis. And and um, and other bases that you can think of. Now, hmm. okay, and this is just a plot of different bases, and you see um, different results. But something that um, is persists is if the system is chaotic, as in these two examples, you have these states that are closing energy very similar. If the system is not chaotic. States that are close in energy may have very different structures. So you start having these big fluctuations. So this will affect our studies of thermalization. So this is an, an exercise for you to study the spin model, study density of states, participation ratio, and so on. And I have data for those. But now coming back to the story of thermalization. So, so is the left side equal to the right side? Hmm. I don't have random vectors anymore, but closing energy, we can have. If we are in the middle of the spectrum, closing energy, we can get states that are very similar. And um, so if you are in the middle of the spectrum, these states that are closing energy will be close to random vectors, not equal. And these expectation values will be all very close. This is an important point. So how close? Um, this all depends on the observable that, that we are studying. We are interested in few body, that's how we put it here, right? In few body observables. So the few body observables, they are not going to detect the structural variations in the structure of the eigenstates. And if you start creating not physical observe, but observes that become many body, like a, um, many, like sigma. So I'm thinking about few body observables, like the, the magnetization of a certain site or, um, or correlations like that. But if you start creating some crazy observables with many <laughs> Xs, Ys, and Zs, and things like that, well, these guys would start detecting that these states are not uh, correlated and they, they could not um, um, thermalize. But physical observables, no problem. Everything will be very similar to that story of um, random matrices. Okay, so then I'm picking one of these simple uh, few body observables just to show to you what I just said, that we still have thermalization for these guys. This first line is for a chaotic system, the one with that single impurity. This second line is another chaotic system with uh, couplings between second neighbors. Last line, integrable. And you see the differences in the structure of the eigenstates, right? Here, 
the participation ratio as a function of the energy is smooth, meaning states closing the energy are very similar. Here you have these enormous fluctuations. This will be, of course, uh, uh, show, uh, reflected in the expectation value of the observables. You see here they are very similar. Here there are these big fluctuations. Uh, so here we expect thermalization, but not there. Right? So that's the story. But again, this is telling me that the system thermalizes. Not only that, you always have to do a scaling analysis. So you see, I'm increasing the system size and those fluctuations are decreasing. So that is good. It's telling us that we are really going to approach that uh, microcanonical ensemble. In the integrable system, at least for the system size that we played, it didn't seem to be decreasing. What is what is shown here? This one. This. So here is an, uh, the expectation value of an observable, and uh, this is the observable. You know, some spin-spin correlation. Yeah? So each point is what we got for that observable with a single eigenstate. Yeah? So very similar to the participation ratio for each eigenstate. Now I have that expectation value of the observed for each eigenstate. And you see that it's smooth. No? So if I'm looking at this region here, they are all very similar. While here, I pick some middle of the spectrum, they are fluctuating a lot. Okay. In in yeah, we have the the Gaussian. Most of the states are in the middle. If the system is chaotic, these states are these uh, almost random vectors. They are not random vectors, but they are almost, and that's what is being reflected here. These ones, even in the middle of the spectrum, this is an integral model. Also has the Gaussian density of states, but even in the middle of the spectrum, we are seeing these uh, these oscillations. So the vectors are not random vectors. There are some correlations there. OK. And then the different quantities to measure these fluctuations. Um, the value of the ex those expectation values minus the microcanonical, or even the extreme of those fluctuations, we always see that it decreases as we increase the system size. Tell me. Ah, well, you could put, we picked this, uh, this one ZZ, but you can pick XX as well, or it doesn't matter, it's just an observable. But you're wondering if uh, the conservation affects whether you have thermalization or not. What, what he's saying is that for the integrable models, people try to come up with um, another ensemble that is not Gibbs ensemble anymore, but it's people call generalized Gibbs ensemble, where they also take into account uh, the, the symmetries. Now, you are wondering if the GG would work only for the Z direction or no? Right. So the, the, this one is thermalizing, and thermalizing here is in the sense of Gibbs ensemble. This one here is reaching an equilibrium that is described by a generalized Gibbs ensemble. That's, that's what uh, people would say. Okay, so, okay, this is just to show, um, let me come back here. This was those, um, the, the size of the fluctuations as a function of energy, showing that uh, uh, 
uh, middle of the spectrum, things get good. Here is the size of the fluctuations, again, size of the fluctuations, but as a function of the parameter that gives us chaos. This is the region of chaos. This is the region of chaos, showing the fluctuations become small. It's just a repetition of always the same thing. But now let me, since I'm, I'm trying to bring some um, history to this story, this is a very nice paper because look at this paper, it's 85. And look what they showed in this paper. I, I, this is a paper that I haven't cited in my early works about transition because I didn't know it existed. But look at what they did. So this is easy in a transverse field. And here you have also the z-direction. So this model can become chaotic depending on the parameters that you pick here. So in the chaotic regime, what did these guys study? Unobservable magnetization as a function of energy, just what I showed to you. And uh, so these um, um, small dots uh, is the, the magnetization, the expectation value of the magnetization for each energy, just as the plot that I showed to you. The solid line is the microcanonical average. And the, the big dots here is the equilibrium value. So they study the, the equilibration and pick this value. And what do you see here? So these are the little dots, the big dots, the line, they're all together in the chaotic regime. And then this is the integrable point. It's hard to see, no? So that's why I put these circles for you to see. You see that it's out. So there is no coincidence. It's 85. Huh? Okay. So, so I, I put this um, like for us to discuss a little bit, no? because um, when people find a paper like that, then comes this, oh, so there is nothing new. No? So you have, you, uh, people have like different radical approach. Oh, there is nothing new or, oh, they didn't do anything. I discovered everything. No? But, uh, but uh, a very old professor once told me something that I thought he was very smart to say. He said, no, every generation has to rediscover everything that the previous one discovered. But in this rediscovery, something new will come, more understanding and so on. So this is to tell you, there is a lot that was done that is new. And, um, there is this whole discussion comparing eigenstates with the few body observable, the structure of the eigenstates, there is the important, super important connection with experiments. Yeah? Um, there is all these discussions that I think you'll be hearing in these lectures, pre-thermalization, driven systems, and so on. I'm going to tell you now about the off-diagonal elements, which people haven't um, discussed in the past. And I think a very important open question in this story is time scales. How long does it take for these systems to finally reach thermal equilibrium? Okay. All right. Today, I think everybody is more tired. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the off-diagonal elements. Um, so we focused a lot on the saturation. How about this part? So there are two interesting things about this part. One is the size of those fluctuations. We said that they, they are small and that they decrease as we increase the system size. The other thing is these values of these off-diagonal elements. I'm going to start talking about the size of the fluctuations. Because if you go back to those old papers, uh, like Perez and these people who are studying chaotic systems, you will find sentences like this. The fluctuations after equilibration, the fluctuations in chaotic systems is small. The fluctuations no, around that uh, integral value in integrable models are large. So this is a distinction between chaos and um, integrability. You will find that, and you find the thing being repeated um, nowadays as well. Large or small makes sense if you have one degree of freedom. Here we are talking about systems with many degrees of freedom. So you have to do a scale analysis large or small, depend on the system size. And you're going to see that 
integrable models or chaotic models, the fluctuations, they all decrease exponentially with the system size. It doesn't matter if I have an integrable model or if I have a chaotic system. You can check. What matters the most is where you are in the spectrum. If you're in the middle of the spectrum, these slopes are like large and you will see this uh, exponential decay, uh, exponential with the system size, this decay for all scenarios. So each curve here is a different model. These guys here where the slope is a bit uh, smaller are integrable models. And these are the chaotic ones, but you see everybody's decaying. Okay. So this is, um, th this, these plots are made for this kind of system, just nearest neighbors or with second neighbors, just to say the fluctuations are all decreasing. And you will see this discussion about size of fluctuations appearing. I've seen it again showing up for out of time order correlated, but again, it's the same story. You can compute for out of time order correlators again, and you will see this exponential decay. Okay? The only exception to this story that we found at least is if you have the non-interacting system, in the non-interacting case, if your observable is in the Z direction, then yes, we get something slow. It's still decaying, but it's slow. Mm -hmm. It's with a, a polynomial decay. All right, so then let's go for the off-diagonal elements. I like this. Um, analysis very much. This is what um, now is called like off diagonal ETH because it really detects whether these states are close to random vectors or not. It's very sensitive to that. So let me, let me pick one observable, okay? The, like the magnetization of a site, K. And now these are alpha and beta are the eigenstates. Now I'm going to project these eigenstates into those are product states, the spins up and down. So now I have this sum of these components, you know, the components of my eigenstate alpha, the components of my eigenstate beta in that um, uh, basis of spin configurations. So, and this value here is going to be either plus one or minus one. So what we have a product, if we had random vectors, is a product of random numbers. So that's a random number. And then we have then a sum of random numbers. That's a Gaussian random number. Right? So if, you're, if we really have random vectors, these things would give us a Gaussian distribution. If we don't have random vectors, we get something that has nothing to do with, uh, with a Gaussian. Right? So this is ETH of diagonal ETH, which is something that people have not studied in the past as well, okay? All right, so um, one just detail, remember the symmetries that are so annoying. If you look at uh, these off diagonal elements, even if you have symmetries, you will see the Gaussian. You may find a peak there, but the Gaussian will be there, okay? So um, that's the story. There is a, an exercise for you to do. Uh, now I wanted to talk a little bit about um, time scales. So I'm going to switch these slides. And I think I have half an hour more because we started a little bit late. How are you feeling? <laughs> Question. Yeah. This is good what you're saying. So these analyses are done, again, just in the middle of the spectrum, where, so you, you have a whole big spectrum, we stay there in the middle where we expect them all to be close to those random vectors. It's always the same story, avoid the others. If you are there, then, then it doesn't matter. It's state of one or 200, they are all very similar. Example, the, uh, yeah, I just take for random vector. Uh huh. Uh, that is what expected energy dependence on the observable, like, uh, okay. in the real systems, yes. Have an observable which, which changes with energy. Which, which, like, 
So that's why I'm, I'm saying we care about these um, few body observables, these little things that uh, they will not detect these this differences or these correlations. But if you're interested, there is a paper that I like by Masood. Okay, I put it here. By Masood and Ivan, uh, where they started, they call it Behmos, so I don't know how to pronounce that, but they started creating observables, not things that you detect in the lab, but these, these kind of things, putting more and more. And then these things start becoming sensitive to the possible correlations in this physical system, the possible correlations in the eigenstates, but not the few body, not the, the ones that are what people measure in the lab. Okay. Oh, yes. The what? Uh, so when we are doing, I think I have this equation. Okay, this equation. So we focused only on this. We said after equilibrium, then I'm going to compare this guy with the microcanonical ensemble. Very good. But what guarantees to you that we are really there? That's the question. Now, so to be really there, you have to study this part as well. And you, if you're playing with random vectors, these components are very small. Here, we don't have the degeneracy. So everything is indicating that, yes, you're going to have these small fluctuations. But we are doing the analysis of this. So I show to you, is it true? Are these fluctuations really small? Yes, they do decrease exponentially. How about these guys? Um, we started that these off diagonal elements are much smaller than those. And what I'm telling you is this analysis of these off diagonal elements is also a good way to detect whether the, your states are really random vectors. And so it's all helping you in this analysis because who knows, maybe you can cook up or find some kind of system where this, you agrees with your microcanonical ensemble. And you say, ah, oh, I got thermalization for this strange model. Well, but did you study the off diagonal elements? Did you study this part? Are you really playing with some ergodic kind of states? That's the, the point. Okay, so it's a complete analysis. And, um, and what I'm saying is if this, um, eigenstates are really close to random vectors, if these things are close to random numbers, you are going to get a Gaussian distribution for these off-diagonal elements. Yes. If my diagonal case is very even though there is a radiation in the octagon regions, my thermalization at now and after equilibration will be the same as in the case. Yeah, but what I'm saying, Edway, is sometimes you who knows, maybe you didn't even study dynamics. I can show to you papers who did that, okay? When they didn't even study dynamics, they just had a model where they studied this. And they studied this without analyzing the dynamics, without analyzing the off diagonal lines. And they studied this and said, oh, this agrees with the microcanonical ensemble. So I have thermalization for this model. And then what we said, uh, this is a, a, a paper with Marcus, no replying to that. So, oh, guys, but you didn't check the off diagonal elements. You didn't check the, these other features that tells you whether you're really playing with uh, random vectors because they had an integrable model. And they were talking about thermalization. So that's yeah, so so this is to say the analysis is more complete if you take everything in, into this discussion. Okay, so now I have to switch the slides. And how do I do this? Well, the guys are gone. This left off. Can... Is, is he coming in? Yeah. With all these quantities, which are uh, signatures of chaos, uh, is there a, can there be a case for real system where some quantities are uh, detecting chaos and some 
Feel body, if you have chaos for physical systems, feel body will find everything. Ah, it's chaotic. All those expectation values are very similar. If you create, thank you. If you create those many body, probably not physical observables, they will be more sensitive. Okay, so of course I'm not going to have um, much time to to discuss uh, all these slides. I regret having told you two lectures. Now I understand, but uh, it was my mistake. But um, I'm going to go straight just to one analysis. There is so much more that I wanted to say. But um, okay, so I'm thinking here about quench dynamics. I start with an initial state from, from this Hamiltonian and I let it evolve according to the total Hamiltonian. No drive, nothing is open, it's isolated, it's all very simple. No? So basically you just diagonalize the matrix. These are our eigenvectors and my uh, initial state is this row. No? If I wrote this Hamiltonian in the basis of this guy, this line is my initial state, fine. So, um, and uh, I'm going to show to you results for this quantity. Probability for finding the initial state later in time. So a survival probability, or an undecay probability, or fidelity, not Loschmidt echo. Some people call it Loschmidt echo, but Loschmidt echo has two Hamiltonians. Here we just have one Hamiltonian. This is an echo. This is just going, okay? But there are papers who call this quantity Loschmidt echo. So that's strange. Um, so I'm going to skip all this because, uh, and I'm going to stop here. Remember when we talked about the spectral form fact, right? It was this sum. Now the survival probability is this quantity. If I project this initial state in the energy eigenbasis, we have components of that initial state with those phases. This is squared. So if I open, I have this double sum, very similar to the spectral form factor. The spectral form factor is an analysis of the spectrum in the time domain. You get the eigenvalues and you study the eigenvalues in the time domain. This is a quantity that depends on the initial state. It's very similar to that, but it has the components of the initial state. So if you prepare your initial state and you're studying this quantity, you study survival probability. It's true that if you, all of the components of your initial state were equal, you would get back to the spectral form factor, but um, you don't have that. No? We are thinking about real um, physical initial states like this, no? where these components will not be all equal. Um, but the quantities are very similar. So everything that we talked about yesterday, that ramp, you know, the correlation hole, will show up here as well if the system is chaotic. And this is very nice because this is one more advantage among those four advantages that I to told you about the spectral form factor or the, the ramp is short and long range correlations. You don't need unfolding. Then the symmetries, you will detect even despite of the presence of symmetries. And now I'm saying an experiment that uh, plays with dynamics should be able to detect chaos through the rim. Okay. So I'm going to skip everything because I just want to get to the last slide <laughs> of comparing two things. See how many, okay. This is the survival probability for random matrix. This is that B2 that we talked about that describes the ramp. This is the saturation. And remember the Fourier transform of that density of states that was the Bessel function. Here you have the Bessel function. And so this is an analytical expression for the whole evolution of the survival probability. The analytical expression is in red, numerics is in black, so you see perfect agreement. So this is under random matrices. What happens now if I do the same, but for a physical system? 
for a physical system that is chaotic. I will have at long times, again, the ramp. All the features at long times will be the same, but how about the short time, okay? And I'm going to skip all this. So the results that I'm showing to you is for this um, disordered system with on-site disorder that is small. So I have my Vigna Dyson distribution. So it's a chaotic system. But remember the density of states for the physical system is Gaussian. So the energy distribution of the initial state that I select is also going to be Gaussian if it's perturbed very far from equilibrium. So the behavior is not going to be the vessel anymore. We'll have a Gaussian decay. And after this Gaussian decay, because we have bounds in the, in the, the Gaussian energy distribution, we'll have a power law behavior exponent two. So what, what is the story? Now, when we are doing that Fourier transform, if I just do the Fourier transform of Gaussian, I get a Gaussian, but here there are bounds in the spectrum. So it's the Fourier transform of a Gaussian with bounds gives us a Gaussian with an arrow function. The arrow function is the one that gives us this exponent, this decay t to minus two. So I put all these together and then I can now compare the random matrix case with the physical model. So long times is the ramp, no? here as well as the ramp is the saturation. So long times is the same behavior, but short times, then the story is different. Short times depends on the energy distribution of the initial state, which in our case is not semicircle. It can be Gaussian, but all those slides before is to tell you there are many other variations, not just Gaussian. You could depend on how strong the perturbation is. It could be a Lorentzian. Um, you could have two peaks. There are many things to explore for the short time behavior here in, in real systems, okay? But long times, everything is similar. But this short time behavior will determine when the ramp is going to start. This is an analytical result. This is a semi-analytical result that is describing the whole evolution. This equation here is the dark curve and the numerics is red, so you see it's very good. So with these two equations, we can find the time where the hole starts, where the ramp starts. You following me? Are you already turned turn off? Okay. So how are we going to get that? So let's start with the equation for the random matrices. This guy is giving us the power law decay. So it's trying to go to zero. The, the B2 is the ramp. So where the two meet, is where the ramp starts, okay? So what we did was pick this and study it at, for long times. We have this cubic decay that you see there in the figure. And for the B2, we studied at short times to see where it's starting, okay? So we put these two um, terms inside here and do the derivative to try to get the minimum. With that, you get exactly the time where the ramp starts. And it's a constant for random matrices. Okay. All right, so it's a constant. Now, let's do the same trick for the physical system. You study this term at long times, you study this term at short times, put them together, do the derivative, and get the time. There it is. The time that for the ramp to show up in a physical system, studying a real initial state, depends on the system size. Increases, D here is the dimension, increases exponentially with the system size. And so here you, you see in the plot, not where the ramp is starting, the time is increasing as we increase the system size from top to bottom, while around the matrix is just a constant. Where is this coming from? In random matrices, in random matrices, our initial state 
is as if it is, no, coupled with all possible states immediately. It doesn't matter how big the matrix is, directly you spread out. In the physical systems, the story is not like that. No? You have these two body couplings, so you go step by step. You have an extension site five, it goes to four and to six, you go gradually. No? So you have just these two body couplings, and in front of you, you have an exponentially large Hilbert space. So to go on visiting all of these states and spread all around and forget about your initial state, it takes much longer. No? And uh, um, and that's what we see um, here. Okay. So this is to find the discreteness of the spectrum, to find the correlation. How about the time to finally saturate? This is the largest time scale that you can imagine. And this comes from analyzing the, um, this B2 function now at long times and uh, finding where it finally reaches that saturation point. The, the derivation is there, but this is Heisenberg time, inverse of the mean level space, and so it's super long time. All this, just to try to close a discussion that is very important that I didn't have with you, which is the time scales for equilibration and for thermalization. What this result is showing that the time increases exponentially with the system size for this quantity. Are we going to talk about thermalization here? Huh? For this quantity, survival probability increases exponentially. So it doesn't make much sense. But um, if you look at other quantities, not all quantities present the correlation hole. In these other quantities, I'm just going to show this uh, figure for you. So here there are other quantities that we studied where there is no correlation hole showing up. So the saturation in these other quantities happen earlier. The time is not growing exponentially with the system size. But what we saw for this model with near stable coupling is still growing. Okay, so can we talk about thermalization there? So a very nice question, I think, for anyone to study is, how long does it take to reach equilibrium? Thermalization, we kind of understand, but how long does it take? How does it depend on the quantity, on the observable? How does it depend on the initial state? How does it depend on the model? These are results for couples between nearest neighbors. If you start putting long range in this story, huh? And um, so there are many things for you to explore there. So I talked too much, I think, I don't know. <laughs> it's 10.30, I know we started a little late, but um, I wanted to at least give you the, this, this picture. Do you have questions? Should I talk a little more? <laughs> what, uh, what is the story? Thanks, Kishore, thanks, depending, thanks, Kishore. Is there anything to be interested in No. No, 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 for the correlation hole you're saying, or, or for these quantities. It has to do with the spread of information and the loss of memory. No, but um, the quantity that we are studying, yeah, the loss of memory. But the quantity that we are studying here is, is a non-local quantity. No, it's not a, like the cone for the magnetization. Anybody will ask there are many things in that sli last slide that I didn't tell you. Okay, so there are many details here. So if you want to sit down, I tell you more. <laughs> yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. So like, but in all of this, do the stars are distributed where it starts go to the equilibrium. So that's a, so. This is a quantity. This is like a an entropy kind of quantity. It's like the inverse of the entropy. It's the inverse participation ratio. So that's why it's decaying. Let me show to you this figure. This is the inverse participation ratio. And we had to multiply by the dimension of the matrix. You see the it's like 2.04 and 2.05. So we really had to zoom in that. And the hole is there. But you, you wouldn't see it if you didn't know it was there. So the, the time when we cross this line is that star that I put to you. And uh, why we said, well, this could maybe be the, term, the equilibration of these quantities, because this hole here, it, it decreases, it disappears as you increase the system size. 
So I, then we saw, okay, this is a quantity that in finite case, it presents the ramp, but very large, it will disappear. So it made sense to try to put this first crossing as the, the equilibration time. Survival probability, it never disappears, okay? Uh, that the ramp is is really there. These um, relative um, um, depths is always fixed. It's always there. It's always one third. We know the minimum. We know the saturation is always there. It's robust. So we cannot just forget about the existence of the ramp for this quantity. For that other one, since it's disappearing anyway, and you wouldn't even know that it was there, we said, okay, so let me put that, um, okay, here. Huh? So let me say that this is equilibrium. But even here, it's still growing slowly, but it's growing. So, if you analyze the orchestration, it's basically the same thing telling that how you're removing the memory. Yeah. So do you get a similar uh, dimensional dependence? Yeah. So for the correlation, who we started playing with it, but um, it, the ramp should be there as well, but, uh, if it's a out of time order correlated with observables, uh, with op operators there, I think it would, well, it is, you would be close to this scenario where there is a, a hole that you almost. Yeah, I think yeah. the okay. Ah, okay. The spin autocorrelation. Yes. Ah, ah, yeah. Okay. So this is the spin autocorrelation function. This is the, the quantity that you're talking about. So let me just. Uh, well, I have it somewhere, the definition, and you, okay, this quantity. Okay, so the spin autocorrelation function, which it, we started studying because it's very similar to the density imbalance. So it's like a, a quantity that we thought, okay, it should be easier for an experimentalist to measure. It shows the correlation hole. And it shows it well, but careful. Let me show to you. Here is the spin autocorrelation function. So it's the, the, the only local quantity that we saw a very nice uh, correlation hole there, very similar to the survival probability. And we were happy. You say, ah, the guys will see. In a finite system, they, they should be able to see it, okay? But this is the quantity that was the tricky one. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing with small sizes, this number uh, is telling us the depth of the, the, the correlation hole. So if you're playing with small system sizes, it is there. But then we saw, oh, we start increasing, it starts disappearing again. Not so fast, but a very large system size, it should disappear there as well. But if you want to, if you're an experimentalist, and that's the people we wrote with Ed, if you want to just detect the, the ramp, five, small sizes is the best. Mm -hmm. And you would either detect with this quantity or with um, survival probability. Mm -hmm. You will always get the ramp if the system is chaotic. And it doesn't matter how large the system is, it will be there. Because that's uh, also a comment that people have. Oh, you've seen this ramp, but it should disappear if the system is very large. But it's not. Everything survives probability. So if I have one system size, I see the ramp here. If I increase the system size, I will see the ramp um, below. But it's always there. And uh, this relative depth that I'm calling is always the same value because this value here is also in our analytical results, okay? This is two over the dimension and the saturation is three over the dimension. So they just keep going down as increase the, the system size. Whenever you have chaos, whenever you have chaos, you will see this for the survival probability always. No? Uh, but uh, depending on which kind of system, perhaps you can make this point starting a little earlier. Like random matrix, you saw it was always one number. No? That's it.
Okay. There is much more that I wish I had told you. So have a look at the slides. And if you find anything interesting, let me know. Uh, I can discuss with you. Okay. Yeah, that's the point. That's what I'm saying. So if these times grow as the system size increases, are we going to talk about equilibration? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let us thank uh, 